Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 to 25. Let's read that together. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 22. I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Greet all your leaders and all the saints, and those who come from Italy send you greetings. Grace be with all of you. Father, we want to thank you for the reading of your word, and as we come to this Closing verses of the book of Hebrews, we want to thank you that throughout the whole of last year, you spoke to us through your word. Father, I pray that if we have not already been doers of the word, that Lord, we will pick up that mantle and walk in obedience and true worship of obedience to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, it's been a wonderful journey going through the book of Hebrews, a journey that we started last year, January. And uh, it's been a year and two months or three months now. And this is, uh, I think, sermon number 46 in this book of Hebrews. So you can pat yourself on the shoulder and say, well done, good endurance. And I hope that the word of God has which is a double-edged sword, has penetrated between the bones and the marrows and the spirit and the soul and has made internal transformation in each and every one of our lives. It's not enough to gain head knowledge. That is one thing. But the important thing is for that to penetrate into the depths of our lives and to transform us into Christ-like uh, holiness. And without holiness, we cannot see God. And uh, he's given us such a wonderful gift, the gift of faith, uh, which uh, uh, helps us to propel us and to, you know, just to trust God, uh, learn, live. And I've always told you, worship is not something that we do through singing and, and, and by poetry or anything. Worship, in its true sense, God is looking for worshipers. What kind of worshipers? Worshipers who will worship him in truth and in spirit. Who are the worshippers who worship God in truth and in spirit? It's not just those who express themselves emotionally to God, but who actually do what God has told them to do. People who walk in obedience. So every time you obey God, you're worshipping God. That is true worship. What we do in singing, poetry and other things is actually praising God. It's actually expressing our awe of an awesome and wonderful God. It's all praise. Worship is actually now our response in obedience to God. When we obey Him in the Great Commission, we preach the gospel, we make disciples, we're worshiping God. When we obey his command to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, which is basically serving God and serving others and putting others ahead of you and, and in a more important place than yourself, and serving and coming to the place of serving, that is love. When we do that, you worship God. That's true worship. And above everything, when we walk in holiness, where we are putting off our carnality and we are putting on the nature of God, the characteristics of God. The character of God rubs off on us as we spend time in His presence and learn from Him and talk to Him and hear from Him. Holiness is imparted upon us and when we walk in holiness, that is worship. That is true worship. And that's the kind of worshippers God is looking for. And I pray that you will be that kind of worshiper. You cannot do as you please, when you please, how you please, and appease your carnal nature and call yourself a worshiper. You cannot. Because that goes against the grain of obedience towards God. That goes against the grain of the character of God. Something valuable that uh, Brother Vinod quoted last 
last uh, portion that he spoke from in the book of Hebrews. He quoted from A.W. Tozer and said, we're not set, we, we are set free from sin, we are not set free to sin. And sadly, the modern church has become so diluted that everything is man-centered. Everything is about a piecing of self. Even our songs, the modern day Christian songs have become so much of man-centered songs, not God-centered songs. I thank our worship team who are, who are really knocking and, you know, selecting songs that are really God-centered songs, not, not man-centered songs. But you listen to the popular Christian songs today, most of them a man centered. It's, it, it's always singing about the I, me, my benefits, what, what I gain. So God is just a provider, an appeaser, so that I get the benefits. Well, nothing wrong in singing about your benefits if you sing one or two songs just when you're, when you're by yourself and you're feeling a little low and you can sing and say, I'm a child of God, you know. But when we are together, we've, we're here, we don't sing about ourselves. We don't sing about our benefits. We sing about the greatness of God. It's all about, it's God-centered. God-centered praise. God-centered worship. And God-centered worship is worship that is obedient to God. So uh, we want to summarize today. I just want us to give, to have a panoramic view of what we've been studying. And um, uh, praise God for uh, ministering to us through this book so the author keeps repeating from chapter 1 onwards, you find that Jesus is better. Jesus is better. I gave you the background of why uh, he has written. And actually, this letter is written to the Hebrews people who became Christian, born-again Christians, from the Hebraic Jewish background. Now, you will wonder why when an when a author is writing a letter, why is he writing to half of the church because the other half of the church are people who got saved from the Gentile backgrounds like most of us here or maybe all of us here. He's writing to the people, to that half of the church which were people who got saved from the Jewish background. Why? There is a reason for this. Because at that time of history, uh, it was a time when still the temple had not been destroyed. And, you know, this, it was the Roman Empire that was ruling the Mediterranean nations at that time. The whole of Mediterranean Europe and Middle East and North Africa. And it was a very tough rule. And there came a, a, an emperor called Nero. Uh, Nero started well. He started as a good ruler. Uh, but at a later time, the power went up to his head. He considered himself God. And then the persecution started, especially for the Christians. And, uh, you know, Christians, uh, it started with, it started with uh, a small form of persecution. And I believe this letter was written at the time when there was a smaller form of persecution where, you know, people would walk by and throw stones at your business and break the glasses of your house and people would kick at your doors and uh, drop garbage, you know, and, and, and those kind of, because the Bible somewhere in, in, this, in the book of Hebrews, it says that you have not resisted to the point of death. And so at that time that we know that Nero later put Christians on a pole in the night on the street and set them on fire and burning Christians were lighting up streets and parties. Uh, it was that gruesome. Uh, people had to pay a price. But it had not come to that stage, but it had come to the stage where you are not getting job as a Christian because you're a Christian. Uh, the moment your employer knows that you're a born again Christian, they, um, they don't give you a job. Um, difficulty in getting livelihoods. Your faith is being questioned. You're being ridiculed. You're being mocked. So it's a difficult time. Now for the why he did not write to the Greek or let's say the Gentile believers, the people who came from the Gentile backgrounds is because they had nowhere to go back to. They held on. Whereas the Jews had something to go back to. So the Hebrews, they, they had the freedom to go back to the synagogue. 
Why? Because Christianity was not an official religion at that time. And so you could be hunted down. So the church was an underground church. You could not meet like here, like here in, even in Kuwait. Right now, this compound is recognized by the government. It is sanctioned. So this is legal. However, what if we had to gather and it was not sanctioned by the government, then it becomes illegal. Whereas the Jewish synagogues were legal, Jewish religion was re legal, legally recognized by the Roman Empire, Christianity was not. And therefore, it was tempting for the Jews, uh, the Jews that had got saved and become Christians, now when the persecution started, it became uncomfortable for them, and so they went seeking the comfort zone, and the comfort zone was going back into Judaism, going back to the synagogue. But what they had to do in order to get back to the synagogue is that they had to stand in front of the assembly. They had to disown Jesus Christ. They had to deny Jesus Christ as Messiah and go back to the Old Testament practices of sacrifices and everything. And, and so the author is repeatedly saying that the Old Testament time and the Hebraic practices was only a shadow of the real thing that was to come. Now, you may, you may see my, let's say you did not meet me, but somebody sends you a photograph of me. So, and tells you that this is so and so and is from so and so place and, and gives some form of introduction about me. And so you have my photograph, you have some information about me, and that's how the Old Testament period is. It's a shadow, it's some information, some shadow that is being given. Now let's say I'm walking and, you know, here as there is light here, there is shadows that are being cast. Now let's say you see my shadow, you may understand something about me by looking at my shadow. But then when you meet me in person and you get to know me, then you don't need to know me through my shadow. You, you, you and I know each other on a personal level and there is fellowship, there is intimacy, there is friendship, there is communication, there is communion. And so the author is saying, now you know the real person, you know the son, you know God. Why go back to the shadow? So you are exchanging the better for that which is, was only a shadow. You're fooling yourself. You're making an, an unwise transaction. And so he starts with saying that Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the angels who are only ministering spirits. Though they are powerful, they are more powerful than us. However, the role of the angels is to minister, is just to obey what God tells them to do. And they go and fulfill those missions. They are better than, Jesus is better than the servants like Moses and Joshua and Samuel and all the others. You know, many times we peg our faith and our hope on people. Sometime back in a church, I met somebody and that somebody told me that, uh, you know, in the, in the course of the discussions that we had said, the day the pastor of this church goes, I go from this church. I felt, I, I just felt my heart breaking. What has this person understood? And why is this person part of a local church? If, if it is because of one person, and, and you make a statement that if that pastor goes, I'm gone, then you have put your hope in a person and not in God. Pastors will come and pastors will go. Jesus Christ never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So let not your hope and your affiliation be attached to a human being. Let it be pegged on the eternal King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So Jesus is better than the servants. We are only servants. We are under shepherds serving under the chief shepherd. We, we do not own the church. Jesus owns the church. He's the master of the church. We are only servants serving under his command. And so don't put, don't peg your hope on us or don't make, you know, your life pegged on us. No, it has to be on Jesus Christ. 
Jesus is better than the priests who stood in the gap. Aaron and his sons, they stood in the gap between God and man and brought the petitions of man to God. There is no longer any more mediator other than Jesus Christ. We have free access into the presence of God. In fact, in the New Testament, we as born-again Christians are called a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And so each one of us is a priest. How do we act as a free priest? How do we fulfill our duty as a priest in this, in this day and age? When we stand in the gap and pray and say, Lord, my family members are not saved. Lord, have mercy, save them. And when you start preaching the gospel to them and showing them the way, when you, when you preach the gospel to your colleagues, when you preach your gospel to the neighbors, to the friends and to the people that God has placed in your life, you become a priest, you stand in the gap, you, you, you're part of the holy nation. And so Jesus is better than the priest. Why? Because as a mediator, he has done his work once and for all. And that sacrifice of Jesus has now fulfilled all the sacrifices that had to be repeatedly made through animal sacrifices in the Old Testament. Jesus is better than the old covenant. Conditional covenant. And now he's brought in, he's ushered in the new covenant, the covenant of freedom. That we are set free to honor God, to worship God, to praise God and to do God's will. We are not set free to do as we please. We are set free so that, what are we set free from? We are set free from the penalty of sin. We are set free from the bondages of sin. We are no longer under the bondages of sin. We are set free now in truth and spirit to worship God and to be of service to God and to mankind. To love and to serve. We are set free, we are set apart from sin so that we can live a righteous and holy life. Jesus is better than all the sacrifices of the Old Testament. Poor animals had to be sacrificed on a regular basis. In fact, if we were living in Old Testamental time right now, all of you would have come with sheep and goats and chicken and doves. And my job would be to stand here and slaughter all those poor animals. And this place would be flooded with blood. Well, praise God, the blood of Jesus Christ has once and for all washed us, cleansed us. And so the, we don't have to bring those poor animals anymore, which was only a shadow to teach us that sin causes death. That was an object lesson to teach us how gruesome is our sin. And what is sin? Sin is simply proclaiming independence of God. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden proclaimed independence from God and they became sinners. We don't become sinners because of sins that we do, but we sin because we are sinners. And God saved us from that condition. The blood of Jesus, when we humbled ourselves, and that's why repentance is important because you cannot repent with pride. The only way you can repent is through humility. And when you repent for your sin, you, you come with a humble heart before God. That is when God can forgive you. So Jesus is better than all the sacrifices. And so the author is telling these believers who, who committed apostasy that you are fooling yourself. You are making a bad transaction. You are going from the real stuff to that which was the shadow. You are going back. And now the problem of that is that there are dangers that accompany you going back. And so you find through the book of Hebrews, there is an appeal and there is warnings. He starts making an appeal, he gives an argument and then he makes a, a, he gives a warning. What are the appeals he makes? First and foremost, that the faith has to be in God. He gives examples of faith that is illustrated in action. All the people that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 are people who did not just say that they believed and lived as they pleased. No. They said they believed and then they acted in obedience. Their faith was proved by obedient action. Abraham was told to leave from the Ur of the Chaldeans. By the way, archaeologists have found out that that was a very comfortable society. It was 
They ha- Abraham was living in a house with running water and heating and a comfortable situation. And then he was told, now leave from here and you're going to live in tents. So faith required him to leave his comfort and make himself uncomfortable in order to obey God. How can you and I think that we have the right for comfort? In fact, the Bible teaches us the opposite. Actually, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your problems are only starting. Why? Because you're living in a world that is steeped in sin and you as one who represents the gospel, who who has the light of God shining in you, you become enemy number one to the world. Enemy number one to Satan. And you become a target. So don't ever think, if you were told that become a born again Christian and all your problems will be solved, I want to correct that understanding today and to tell you that if you become a born again Christian, your problems will only start at that time. But praise be to God. He's the one who empowers us. He, the Holy Spirit comes along, fills us, baptizes us, and makes us overcomers. We do not succumb to those problems, but he makes us overcomers and victorious in spite of the challenges. So faith in God. And secondly, to keep, he gives, keeps giving an appeal to keep your eyes fixed upon Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith. Why did Jesus die on the cross? More often than not, the answer that we will receive is for the forgiveness of our sins. True. But it is for more than that. Jesus died on the cross not only for the forgiveness of sin, because if it was only for the forgiveness of sin, it would be incomplete. Then what happens? We were sinners. We were forgiven from our sin, uh, from the penalty of sin. And then we will continue to do what? We will continue to do as it pleases us. We will continue to sin. So if Jesus died only for the forgiveness of our sin, then the gospel is incomplete. However, Jesus died not only for the forgiveness of our sin, but also to impart holiness to us. And what is holiness? Holiness is to be set apart from sin as God is set apart from sin. Holiness is... For us to imbibe the character of God. No longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. We sang that song today. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So daily, on a daily basis, we are being transformed into the likeness of Jesus through our willful obedience, through our study of his word. And as we study his word, as we pray, as we get close to God, know his heart, we make transformation in our lives. You know what salvation looks like? I want to give you a a picture, illustration. Say that you're drowning in the water and then somebody who is standing on solid ground throws you a rope and tells you, hold on to that rope and I will pull you in. And then you hold on to the rope and he pulls you in and brings you to solid grounds. When you come on the solid grounds, can you say that I saved myself because I held on to the rope. No. The initiative was with the person who threw you the rope. The rope belonged to the person who threw you the rope. But the person told you what? Hang on. Hold on to the rope. There is something you and I have to do. And this is the problem with modern Christianity. Modern Christianity teaches us that you receive Jesus Christ. You are free. You are absolved. You don't have to do anything. Everything will happen automatically for you. No. You have to hold on to the rope. But the one who gives the rope, the one who pulls you in, is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So you cannot absorb yourself from what God expects you to do. And what does God expect you to do is to walk in obedience to Him, submitting to Him on a daily basis. And therefore, a transformation happens. And then he gives a warning. He gives an appeal. And then he gives a warning. And he says, danger. 
Do not go back. Do not return to where you came from because that would be apostasy. If you deny Jesus Christ after having been saved, after having experienced the, the freedom that the Holy Spirit gave through salvation, through the forgiveness of the penalty of sin and giving you provision for daily holy living and after having experienced all of that and knowing the truth and then going and standing and denying Jesus Christ, that is a point of no return. You will lose your salvation. I know that I'm treading on theological feet of many people who believe in eternal salvation. Eternal, salvation is eternal, absolutely, from God's point of view. He's not a God who goes back on his covenant. However, you and I still have the free will, still have the freedom to make a choice whether we will live for Christ or deny Christ. If you're a backslider, good news is you can come back. But if you are an apostate and you have denied Jesus Christ in front of the assembly and have disowned Christ after having received the gift of salvation, then the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 6 and chapter 10, very clearly, not only here, go to the book of Matthew, go to, the, go to all the apostolic epistles, you will find it very clearly written. You cannot take advantage and abuse the grace of God and go scot free. The problem is that you will disqualify yourself. And you will go beyond a point of no return. And I pray that that doesn't happen to any of us. That we will not make the willful choice of, of apostasy. That come what may, we will hold on to Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. Don't go to the place of no return. Don't commit the sin of apostasy. Because then there is no way to come back. Don't just start the race, but persevere and finish it. Our salvation, I have explained so many times, the salvation from the penalty of sin, the moment we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the moment that we humbled ourselves and said that I am a sinner, I need a Savior, and cried out to Jesus, who alone can save you. He set us free from the penalty of sin, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We were set free from the penalty of sin, but still, we are still living in the presence of sin. Sin wants to encroach us. It wants to take advantage of us. It wants to come and rule over us again. And so today, as you are alive, as I am alive, every day is a day of taking a step forward, of sanctification, of cleansing, of putting off the things of sin and carnality and putting on that which belongs to heavenly behavior. And finally, one day, either we are still alive and Jesus returns, we will be translated and we will be caught up into heavens or we would have died and then Jesus returns, we will be awakened from that state of sleep and given a new body and we will meet up with Christ Jesus. That is when our salvation becomes complete and when we enter into God's kingdom into his heavenly kingdom at that time we can say I'm saved I'm really saved I have received it I'm holding on to it I have a deposit I'm working on it but when I enter into his presence you and I can say I'm really saved I've made it I just did not start the race but I finished the race and that's why Paul said I have run the race. I have kept the faith. And therefore he had the confidence. And therefore there is a crown of righteousness that is kept for me. But not only for me. But everybody who will run the race and be faithful. And finish the race faithfully. There is a crown of righteousness that is kept. And you will hear the master saying. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Welcome to your rest. Beautiful Sabbath. I look forward to that. And I want to encourage you today, do not fall back. Do not compromise your Christian life. 
Do not live mediocre lives. Do not live in a backslidden state. The problem of backslidden straight state is that if you don't make correction, you will keep backsliding, you will keep backsliding, you will keep backsliding till the point when your conscience is fully killed and you will finally deny Jesus Christ and you will commit the sin of apostasy. And I pray that you don't live a backslidden state. There is no, there is no neutral Christian. And there is no Christian who is a secret Christian. There is nothing called a secret Christian. Because the moment you are a born again Christian, the mandate to preach the gospel is upon you. The mandate to make disciples is upon you. You are a witnessing Christian. In fact, why is the Holy Spirit imparted to you? What is said in the book of Acts chapter 1? Go and wait in Jerusalem so that power will come upon you. You will be empowered by the Holy Spirit. For what? For you to feel good or for you to, you know, uh, to have certain gifts that you lay hands on people and that they will get healed or, or for you to prophesy? No, those are for the edification of the church so that the reason is so that you may be my witnesses where in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there is no secret believer. The moment you are a born again Christian, you are a witnessing Christian. If, you are, if nobody knows that you are a born again Christian, then please, I doubt your salvation. Ask yourself if you truly got saved. Because if you truly got saved, you will obey God. You will walk in holiness. You will, you will witness for Jesus. You will serve God and you will serve people. Those transformations will start happening in your life. I want the uh, music team to come. Let us all stand up together. I want us to read the scriptures once again in Hebrews chapter 13 verses 20 to 21. Shall we read that together? Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.